So we're going to kick off today's su summit with Stacy Tyrell. Stacy is the ESRD four for Network One and Six, and she is the subject matter expert for patient and family engagement. So, Stacy, welcome. Good morning, Stephanie, and good morning to all that are attending. Welcome to day two of our National Patient and Family Engagement Learning and Action Network Patient Summit. As Stephanie just mentioned, I am the core for Networks 1 and 6 of the ESRD Network, as well as assigned as the subject matter expert for the Patient and Family Engagement uh, Initiative. Yesterday, we heard from patients and healthcare leaders on a variety of topics and engaged in lively discussion with panel experts on strategies on addressing foods insecurities and way in which to initiate partnerships to address this constraint. As well as we discussed around Medicare and Medigap plans and uh, telemedicine and how to improve mental health overall. Today, we hope to just continue in those discussion where patients and families will continue to drive the agenda in conversations. And as we noticed yesterday, we were running a little short on time. So just to allow all presenters to have an opportunity to um, engage appropriately and have some healthy discussions, we'll go ahead and kick it off. And thank you again for joining us. And we look forward to another successful day. Thank you, Stacy. Just real quick over the agenda again this morning, uh, we're going to kick it off with kidney transplant referral assessment and the wait list. We'll have a short break and then we'll conclude with a presentation on self care in the dialysis facility. So, next slide. Um, so, we're uh, next slide. So, I'm going to introduce uh, Lisa Goodwin. Lisa has worked in the renal field, whether in dialysis or kidney transplant, since 1996. She has worked in several dialysis clinics offering hemodialysis in center and home, as well as peritoneal dialysis. Lisa is a strong advocate for transplant and has doubled the waitlist numbers in her current clinic in less than two years. She is a member of the Council of Nephrology Social Workers and current chair of the Tampa area CNSW chapter. She has given presentations on dialysis and transplant topics to the National Kidney Foundation, of Florida Renal Professional Forum meetings, the NKF Spring meetings, HSAG Network 7 annual meeting, American Nephrology Nurses Associating meetings, and other organizations. She has written articles for various renal newsletters and publications. She has facilitated a treatment options education group with other renal professionals and led support groups in the Tampa St. Pete area. Uh, joining her today is Colette King, a kidney transplant recipient. So I'm going to turn it over to Lisa now. Thank you, Stephanie. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon now. Um, we're here in Florida, so it's it's noon. Um, I'm joined by Colette today, and we have our camera on, but I'm not sure if you can see us. So um, we're going to act as if you can, just in case. Um, so uh, if you want to go to the next slide, we're calling our presentation walking together because the 2 of us did walk some of this, um, but Colette walked all of it. So I was fortunate enough to uh, join her. I think if you can go back, maybe I have it out of order. Maybe sure. No. Okay. Sorry. I have my part out of order. Um, so I'm sorry. Go back to that next slide. So just, um. A review for people that may not, you know, kind of realize um, how education is done. For me, in the initial assessment, you know, I'm always asking open ended questions. So, how did you find out you have a kidney problem? And then try to find out about treatment options because I do want to address home therapy, but then also during the course of the conversation, progress to what questions do you have about transplant? Um, and try to, even from that initial assessment, when someone is maybe ill and not feeling well because they've been uremic, I still want to start putting that seed in their mind that this is a goal that we're going to come back to. Um, I do keep brochures from my local transplant centers and UNOS info so that I can give some information. I may not give it initially, but I have it available that I can follow up. And then, of course, per, um, you know, CMS guidelines, then we're doing a 90 day update. And so then I'll come back around um, to the question about transplant. 
Ideally by now, you know, uremic symptoms have revo have resolved more. Um, the person is, you know, starting to really hit those the goals that we have per CMS. And then um, now we can start looking ahead a little bit more. Um, so if the interest is noted, then, you know, I want to make sure that this is someone that would be appropriate. Um, and, and ideally, I will have done that before I go back to that 90 day. If someone is dealing with cancer or an infection, I certainly don't want to make a referral at that moment. Um, and then if the person says, no, I, I don't think I'm ready yet, or I have a lot going on for whatever reason, then I want to revisit at least annually. And certainly um, I will sometimes revisit much more frequently and much more often depending on the situation based on that conversation. So that may be how other people do it, um, but that's sort of um, in my head of, of how my progression is, is just from the very beginning, have it out there. Um, next slide. Okay, and then within Fresenius, you know, we need to document transplant education um, for each patient admission. There is an opt out within our education documentation. If people are over 75 in a nursing home on hospice, there are also opt outs for any medical contraindications such as cancer, wounds, other infections. Um, and then for our records, I keep track of the referral dates, dates of appointments with the transplant center, evaluation status, and then if there's a denial or progression to active listing, and then also living donor involvement. So those are kind of the steps that I'm looking for as someone is moving through the process. Um, next slide. All right. And so once I've made a referral, I like to uh, utilize a form that uh, we have internally that uh, people can use to keep track of their referral status. And I include the transplant center's phone number on that. Um, and so trying to get them to realize from the very beginning that this isn't a magic process that you're allowed to be in contact with the transplant center because sometimes it I think people are intimidated about calling their coordinator and they think that maybe they're not supposed to do that. So, but my impression with transplant staff is always that they wanna hear from the person directly because that shows their interest and motivation. Um, but social workers can and maybe should contact transplant centers as well. And certainly under HIPAA, you know, that is considered continuity of care because I have had social workers that I've talked to that feel that they should not reach out, but sometimes I feel that that's helpful to keep um, the person that's in the process um, motivated that that there isn't a breakdown in communication and that can sometimes happen. So um, I feel that that you know, helps um, not just the rapport between the patient and the transplant coordinator, but the patient and myself, uh, especially if it's someone new that you don't know very well. Um, next slide. Okay, and then I do talk to the patients about the process, uh, just that, you know, there's the initial appointment, um, which may include two or three visits to the transplant center face to face or uh, during the pandemic, there was some virtual education and evaluation um, testing phase for for me. Um, I try to encourage the the person to go through the transplant hospital. A, because there's no chasing of the medical records as much, um, but also then um, you're also getting used to making the trip to that facility um, and, and getting that familiarity. So, and there is usually a time frame for completion uh, with the pandemic that certainly got challenged quite a bit. And I've had people that were in referral status when the pandemic started that are still struggling to complete things and get through the process. So that did create a lot of barriers for our patients. And then, um, you know, the patient, whether they should be the ones to call to schedule or the transplant scheduler making contact. Um, if, if the patient hasn't heard from someone in a while, um, 
I will encourage them to call to get themselves scheduled. And then I try to also explain that there may be, you know, if you're given eight tests, um, are you, if something comes up on that test, you may need additional tests to make sure that there's no further problem so that they don't have an expectation that these eight or 10 tests may be the only test. Um, and then, of course, at medical review board, uh, when the case is reviewed for determination for listing, if it's initially a no, what are the steps to potentially resolve that no, or is this a hard stop? And then that make, you know, bring up other conversation. And then also living donor evaluation. So um, it can be very difficult for my patients that have living donors and work up to understand that although this person is acting on their behalf, that they are entitled to confidentiality and so that their workup and medical information is not an open book. And especially if the donor has something discovered that they don't want to share, that can become a very contentious situation. So um, just trying to guide people through that situation can uh, require some tact and sometimes a little bit of finesse that you weren't expecting. Um, next slide. Okay, and then for my part, just encouraging people in the listing and waiting period, you know, that they need to try to work to stay healthy, report hospitalizations, changes in health, changes in insurance, any out of town travel, um, and then also tempering the initial excitement because that can fade, you know, that excitement of being listed, that can fade as time goes by when nobody has called. Um, and sometimes knowing an average wait time, that might be helpful. It may also be discouraging if you have someone that's listed, goes through the process and gets listed right away. Um, sometimes knowing that it may be three to five years or longer can be discouraging. Um, the, the blood draws, whether monthly, quarterly, annual testing can keep the transplant centers up to date, but with such long periods of um, no contact with the transplant center, that can be frustrating also. Um, some of the transplant centers will do visits on a regular basis to maintain that face-to-face -face contact to help the patient stay motivated and to also keep themselves updated as to status. So, um, and then, you know, we're not, sometimes there is no way to know for sure how long it will be if a living donor isn't an option. Um, and I have found that calls to be the backup can be helpful um, because then the, the person gets a look at the next step, which is to be called, but that can be frustrating to be so close and not get the transplant. So sometimes that, you know, then there's some follow up with that. So just, I think if you're aware that it is a long process, there are many steps to it, there can be um, positive steps along the way, but there can also be times when it's discouraging or feels negative for the person going through it and just to be sensitive to that. Um, next slide. Okay, so my, my mantra, I, you know, I certainly can't get on the transplant list, but I want to walk the walk with somebody, you know, it, it isn't just, here's a list of things and good luck and, you know, let us know if you get listed. I feel like you know, we have to continually have communication and um, support, mostly because I feel like I need to normalize that the process is lengthy. I don't want people to lose hope or get frustrated and just stop trying. Um, and as Colette will discuss, sometimes more than one referral may be needed for approval for listing. I also want to normalize, again, that need for confidentiality for the living donors, that this is not something personal or cruel on the part of the transplant center. Um, in my daily work in the clinic, I want to focus on uh, what you can do in the here and now to stay healthy. So fluid control, coming to treatment, taking medications, watching the diet, and then daily are those are the daily tasks that you need to try to maintain the healthiness that you will need when they call you. And then just to celebrate successes and offer support if there are setbacks or denials, um, this truly is a journey for most people, it, and, and there are ups and downs along that journey. Um, so I think that is the end of my 
part, if you want to go to the next slide, I just want to introduce this is Colette. Um, so I'll let her kind of tell you a little bit about herself, um, but I put just some initial information on the slide and then um, we're just going to have a little bit of conversation about her situation. So um, hi, Colette. Thank yeah. you for joining me and doing this with me. Thank you for yeah. having me. This is such a privilege to be able to speak to all of you um, about transplant. Um, my story is probably a little bit different than most people's story. Um, my first dialysis was in August of 2015, and I actually started out on PD. And what happened in my case, um, I ended up transitioning to, um, to um, hemodialysis um, in-house. And so what happened was I ended up having an infection um, that I got shortly after the loss of my mom. Um, and so that took me away from the PD. Um, I just chose not to do it. My kids were a little bit older at that, at that point in time. I had been on PD for probably around three years by that time, and they had gotten a little bit older. And so with that, I went ahead and transitioned um, to hemodialysis, where I met my social worker, um, Miss Lisa. Um, in any case, um, some of the challenges um, that I went through, like I said, um, I'm a double amputee, just so you know, um, I'm a below the knee amputee, um, but double amputee, um, had some ambulatory issues, um, definitely had a low albumin after all of that. Um, my albumin was at 1.8. Um, so in order to be transplanted, you have to have at least a four. So that in itself was a process for me to obtain um, since I had lost so much albumin um, due to where I was with the healing process with my, um, with my legs. Um, some of the other things that happened, um, the restriction in fluid intake, um, that was a hard thing for me because I had always been able to just kind of drink at will um, but um, getting into that process of realizing that I was only hurting myself when I overdid um, with the fluid, um, it took a minute for it to get to my to get to me or to get into my head. Hey, look, you can only drink so much. Um, and so after that, also the renal diet, um, we had to work on it. <laughs> we we definitely had to work on it. Um, definitely became some adjustment there with it. Um, our dietitian um, was awesome in, you know, trying to keep us on track. They did the monthly um, evaluations and they would hand those out to you. And I know initially I had my eyes covered because I didn't want to see them at first. But um, once I started to look at it and really take it seriously, more seriously, um, because I wanted to live, then it became more of a challenge, like a game almost. Okay, let me see if I could keep my fluid under this for the weekend, or let me see if I could keep my fluid under this um, on certain days or my salt restriction down to on certain days. And eating, um, the challenge to eating, um, cheese, I love cheese. Yeah, she does. Loved cheese. <laughs> I can vouch um, for that. And so that was a big challenge. But um, just really realizing, you know, what mattered most. Did my life matter most or did the cheese matter most? Sometimes the cheese won out at times, just being honest. <laughs> um, but um, as I got more adjusted, um, it became less of a priority for me. And so the living became more of the priority for me. Right. And Colette, um, I wanted to just make sure that we mentioned that when you were on PD, initially there was a referral done to transplant. Yes. But because of those amputations and the infection, that that had to be closed. And that's where the um, request was given that any new referrals for transplant, that the albumin would need to show as being at four. So 
Um, there were many, many months where I would go chairside to see her um, with the latest lab, and it would have gone up, you know, a tenth of a point, two tenths of a point, and it we we were just really. Um, working together and everybody was giving such positive reinforcement to help her get there. But um, the the day did come when it was four and there was some rejoicing chair side and then there was a new referral made. So, yes, yeah, yes. Very happy about the new referral. Definitely. Yes. So, um, and as you can see, she has, you know, we listed some of her strengths that she um, dealt with. Um, you know, to get through this. So I think um, not everybody has the same positive attitude that she has. I certainly understand that, but, um, you know, that that helped quite a bit. Um, I would have to agree um, definitely on um, my faith. Um, my faith definitely played a key factor in that. Um, I did have a lot of um, positive reinforcement from my family. Um, from supportive friends um, and just really looking at it as um, being determined to continue to go through the process. My process was on the front end more than the back end for me. Um, so I started in 2015. I got transplanted in 2022. So it was a long process. Um, so just so um, you're aware of it, but, and then COVID hit in the midst of that. So um, that did draw it out even further, right. but it is definitely doable um, in terms of waiting, definitely having that sense of humor um, where you can laugh, um, you have to be able to laugh at yourself, to have to be able to laugh. And one of the things that I found most comforting about moving from PD um, to um, hemodialysis in center was um, the camaraderie of having other people that were going through the same thing that you were going through. Um, it might have had some different um, issues. They may have had a little bit, you know, of different issues or things like that, but at least you had that camaraderie where you were able to talk to other people that kind of understood what you were going through. Um, so that was definitely one of the best things for me. Yeah. And there's a question in the chat that asks, what kind of things did you do to improve your albumin? Um, lots of protein, um, lots of chicken, lots of um, lots of meat, um, lots of peanut butter, lots of, you know, beans, um, and no cow bars. No cow bars. Yes, our dietitian loves the no cow, so N O C O W bars. So she really talked those up uh, to the patients. So, mm -hmm. all right. And then um, if you'll go to the next slide, please. So, this, so she, so Colette had physical challenges during dialysis, and those challenges bled over into her evaluation and wait list time. So, again, um, you know, you had talked to me about, you know, that you had to fight off some negative thoughts. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about that and, um, you know, how you um, stayed positive. Right. For, for me, the negative thoughts came in, like, is my albumin ever going to get high enough to be transplanted? Um, and sometimes you have that um, overriding um question in the back of your mind, you know, especially after you've been there for for a little bit. Um, okay, am I am I gonna be transplanted? When is my life gonna return back um, to normal? Um, and those types of things. And what I did a lot of prayer, a lot for me, um, being able to talk, writing um, a lot for me. Um, help me. It was very therapeutic. I had a lot of supportive friends. Um, you know, one of my best friends um, would, you know, come, she would take me out. We would get out and just go do something and try to get my mind off of it. Um, you know, my family, my husband, um, my kids, um, being able to um, be around them, my in-laws, my um, mother-in-law um, was very crucial. 
um, in this. My husband, definitely very crucial, um, but definitely my faith in God definitely helped a lot. Um, a lot of dialogue. I would talk to um, Miss Lisa um, about things sometimes when it, you know, got a little heavy. Um, I would definitely speak to her. Um, the staff um, in-house was very supportive. Um, you know, they would make you laugh. They were here to work, but they definitely um, bought joy to my life. Um, and finding that internal joy, um, you know, like I said, definitely my relationship with God definitely was a key factor. But you just find ways to make it work. Um, if you're creative, um, find something that you can do. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to be the best at it, but it does help the time move by faster. One of the questions that I see in the chat, so this person says, I have so many patients that are on the transplant list and they overdo it with fluids. How did you overcome that? I feel my patients are putting their hearts at risk. Um, the easiest way is a calculated plan and a cup. <laughs> a cup. Um, if they have a certain, uh, using a measuring cup, um, that's what I did a lot of times. I would use a measuring cup. Um, it, I would know how much I, how much fluid I could take in. I can't have more than this. So I tell you what, let me space it out. I'll drink a little bit here. I'll drink a little bit here. And we live in Florida. So Florida is definitely hot and humid. So it definitely has the potential um, to make you want to consume even more. Right. But um, if you know, hey, look, this is what I got to do to live, you have to prioritize it. Um, there are times, sometimes I overdid it now. That's just honest. Mm -hmm. Um, but what you do, you can't just fall off the boat and stay off the boat. You have to decide, okay, I fell off last week. Let me get back on this week. And it's like I said, if you treat it as a game um, with that, okay, last week I didn't do good, but now I got to do better this week um, and challenge your own self, um, then that makes it a lot easier. It makes it a lot easier. And then um, Sarah replied that she had to be put on hold on the transplant list after she had a heart attack and that what helped and heart attack and lung surgery and what helped her is having a positive attitude. I feel like sometimes the positive attitude like can cover so many things because it gives you that strength to keep moving forward. So thank you for that, Sarah. So then, so transplant wasn't the end of the challenges for you though, and congratulations on your one year anniversary. We're so happy for her. We're one year old. Yes, one year old. Um, so some of your challenges post-transplant, can you talk about that a little okay. bit? Okay, um, post-transplant, um, I had a, I was very happy to be transplanted, let me just say that. Um, Tampa General was where I had my transplant at. Um, and um, one of the things that I went through was a sleeping kidney. Um, before I had the transplant, I actually went um, to go into the hospital. I was in clear water and my graft stopped working. So I ended up in the hospital um, and then the transplant people called me while I was in the hospital and told me that they had a kidney. Um, unfortunately, what happened for me was the first one was not viable. So that was one, um, one thing that happened for me. But believe it or not, within the next probably day, day and a half, um, they called me back and they said, okay, this time we have a kidney. And it was like 10 o'clock at night um, that they call. So they will call you at any time. So it's definitely important to have that phone with you. Um, make sure that you know, it's on so that you get your calls. Um, it was 10 o'clock at night, um, and I was really discouraged, kind of bummed out about the first kidney because it just didn't work out. But I just realized that, okay, that wasn't the kidney for me. Um, and so we went on back. We um, got the second call um, from transplant saying they had a kidney. We got there immediately, um, and... Um, they went ahead and gave us, we were in surgery by the next morning. Um, I think we got to the hospital, it was probably around 11.30 p.m. Um, that evening. 
um, and the next morning I was in surgery with the transplant. But I did have um, a deceased donor, um, so I did not go through living donor. Um, and the deceased donor, with the deceased donor, I had what they called a sleepy kidney. It was a little groggy. Um, so what it did do was allow me um, or make me have to do a few dialysis sessions after I was transplanted. But um, after around maybe three, um, we were good to go. It woke up and um, been out of dialysis ever since then. Um, some of the other um, challenges was COVID, which made it a little bit longer, um, stretched the process out prior to the transplant. Um, but just staying um, focused, making sure that you keep up with your coordinator, um, let them know you're still interested. Okay, what tests do I have to do? And she would always tell me, okay, this is coming up before, this is coming up after. So um, that happened. Um, again, dietary restrictions. You still have some dietary restrictions even after the kidney um, transplant. No feta cheese, no blue cheese. <laughs> Always the cheese. Always the cheese for me. <laughs> um, but um, but it's worth living. Um, also, there are chances that um, there are side effects to medication as well. Um, one of mine for me was um, loss of hair. Um, and I just throw a wig on or do something with my hair and keep it moving. That I realized um, that my hair is not my identity. And so um, even though, you know, that may be for some people, um, I like living, so I'm able to deal with that. That's just one of the challenges that I face. Will that happen to everyone? No because everyone has different um, different um, side effects to meds. Um, so everyone handles that differently. But just because it happened to me does not mean that's gonna happen to you. Um, I did have no issues or no complications with taking the medications um, in terms of um, anything GI, anything like that. Um, never had a problem with that. Um, a transplant team was wonderful and is wonderful. Um, there are chances that you may become, because you're immunosuppressed, which we are um, doing dialysis anyway, but after you have the transplant, that's also going to be an issue. Um, so just so you're aware of that, um, I also have um, grandchildren that live with me and there are many multi-generational um, families nowadays, especially um, where grandchildren may live with um, grandparents or children may live with parents. Um, so that's one of the things trying to make sure that you keep yourself healthy. If you do know that someone is sick, you do need to make sure that you're constantly washing your hands. You do need to make sure you're not keeping your hands in your face. Um, you do need to make sure that you wear your mask. That is one of the things that you should do. Um, and I try to do that often, often as I can. Right. Um, Coming in here right now, she has her mask laying there and I have mine. So because we're using the conference room at the dialysis unit. So we took it off just for the purpose of this. So right. um, and then if we can go to the next slide, I think that's our last slide because we want to save some room for some questions. Um, okay, so we, we wanted to talk about what were some recommendations that Colette would give other people going through the process, especially having kind of come out on the other side of transplant. So if you want to talk about this slide a little bit. Okay, um, you do want to make sure that you look at the cost. Um, know what your insurance covers. Call your insurance company know what they cover, but your transplant center is also going to alert you to any financial um, obligations, um, anything in regards to, um, you know, costs for transplant, anything that would be a financial obligation for you. They will also communicate that with you. They're there actually to help you um, to, so your transplant will be successful. So um, knowing that 
and asking questions. If you think of something, um, let your transplant coordinator know, um, hey, you know, this is going on. Um, I need you, you know, can you check this out for me? Why is this like this? Um, so use, using or utilizing the resources that you have available to you, making sure that you're following up with your doctors, making sure that you're keeping your appointments is a must because that is a key to stopping um, any type of infection, um, catching it early so that it can be treated, so that um, anything that happens like that, um, that could possibly push you to rejection is caught early so that you won't reject is the important part in making sure that you're taking your meds on time and you're taking them daily. And in our conversation, getting ready, you know, kind of putting this together, um, I quoted uh, Colette because she felt this is, the, she used the phrase, trying your wings to push herself in recovery. She certainly did that while she was learning to walk with her prosthetics. We we had conversations about um, learning to drive again and um, walking, you know, use it, instead of using like the wheelchair to the walker, the walker to a cane. Um, so she was already used to pushing herself, but she also had to continue to push herself in recovery after transplant, which I think I was a little bit surprised to hear you say. Um, but as she already, and she kind of repeated this today, the adjustments to her were worth it because she has her life back. And you told, you said it, I'm thriving. And if you can see this woman head to toe, you absolutely know she's thriving. So, and I want you to say the last one. Um, it sounds funny, but I'm so happy to urinate every day. I look forward to, wake, <laughs> to waking up. And, um, oh, I got to go to the restroom. That was um, one of the biggest draws for me. Um, and I'm just really happy about that. Um, it did afford me, and I'm still going through the process of it and still going through um, treatment, um, still going through for different things. But it's been a true blessing just to be able to get up and, and go in. Um, changing um, what you do from using dialysis um, time for like three and a half hours or three hours and 45 minutes, four hours at times um, to now having that four hours back with my family or having um, four hours to get something else accomplished. Um, I still go through, but you know, I'm here and I'm still smiling and I'm smiling my way through it. So yes. it can be done. Yes. So um, that was the end of our presentation. I thank you so much for doing it with thank me. for having me. I was so excited um, that she, that I ran into her here at the clinic and that um, because, you know, once people are transplanted, then a lot of times you don't hear from them, but we have stayed in touch a little bit over this year. So it was nice that I ran into her um, and that she was able to give us the time today. So I guess, Stephanie, we will turn it back over to you uh, for questions and um, any other comments that people would like to make. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you. I'll put my video back on. There were a few more comments we can look at in the chat, but I want to just say thank you, Lisa, for your presentation, Colette, for sharing your story and your journey with us today. Um, you've had definitely uh, a rough road, but here you are today to, to say it can be done. Hopefully very inspirational. A lot of nice comments have come in through the chat about your, you personally being, you're right, um, you know, strong lady. Thank you for sharing your powerful story. And could, yeah, and I agree. Congratulations on one, your one year anniversary for your kidney. That's, that's awesome. So. Yeah. <laughs> Any yeah, blessings, you great guys. story, positive attitude. And I think, you know, Lisa, you said it earlier, sometimes that positive attitude can carry you more than everything else. You know, that right. will make it, you know, you'll get through that. So um, some, you know, I wish some of my patients could hear your story. Well, the good news is uh, this is recorded. It will be posted to our website and you're more than happy to go and share 
any of it or all of it with patients, staff, whoever you feel like might, you know, get any benefits from this. So that is one good thing. So, and, um, you, you know, uh, I think, you know, Colette, you shared about how you kept hope and faith and because that was a very long journey you had. And I had a question for Lisa made me think of it. Lisa, as a social worker, what kind of things have you done to maybe keep patients hopeful during their long, you know, wait time on these transplant lists? Um, it can be challenging, you know, at, at first, everybody's kind of riding that high of having completed all of those tests and gotten that approval. Um, and so, you know, I've had people that are like, I've got my bag packed, I'm ready. They're answering every scam call that comes just in case. Um, and so, you know, at where you have, and so that's great. And, but then when you start you know, seeing somebody a few months down the road that's starting to be maybe a little discouraged or, um, you know, feels a little frustrated, then, you know, that's where you really have to talk about that this is a journey and it's going to take time. Um, and that they're really, the frustrating part is if you knew that your transplant was going to be March 31st of 2022, then in some ways you could settle down and you'd be like, okay, I know when it's going to happen, but nobody knows. And so um, that's, that's the hard part is you don't want to give false hope and say, well, I'm sure it'll be by the end of this year or, um, you know, maybe a few more months. Um, so you have to avoid saying things like that, that then can maybe get in a person's head that, can actually cause us another setback down the road. So that's where I try to focus on, you know, um, are, are you staying busy? Are you getting exercise? Are you, you know, maybe now's a good time to travel, knowing that it may be a little bit of time. Do you wanna go ahead and go see your grandkids? And, and then that way, when we get closer to the time, you know, and you wanna be closer to home, you won't have missed any opportunities to travel now. Mm -hmm. And so try to maybe a little bit of distraction, but also just, you know, not really focusing so much on that. I don't tend to ask about it so often then as I do maybe when we're in an evaluation process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. One of the comments, um, I don't know if you saw from Amy, she says, I know some of my patients get discouraged when they get that letter that they're not being listed due to some barriers. I always tell them, the letter doesn't necessarily mean no, but not right now. So that's a, you know. And that's a great that. way to put it mm -hmm. because, um, you know, I've had people that I've referred three times before they got listed um, for whatever reason. And I've had people closed out for, in my opinion, dumb things, you know, that um, paperwork was missing, but the test itself had been done but there was a lack of follow through to make sure that that test result got to the place it was going. You know, the, the person assumed their doctor's office was faxing it. And so they, they didn't follow up. And then, you know, the transplant center, maybe that coordinator was busy and just looked and saw that there'd been nothing turned in in six months or three months and closed the case out thinking the person wasn't really interested. So there, there can be, you know, kind of, Dumb, in my opinion, dumb things like that that can cause people to get closed out. But right. people worry if they get a letter saying no for any reason, that that means they're not a candidate because they're so much hope riding on that referral. So, um, you know, I try to also tell people, don't be discouraged. You know, we can try again or and if it is a legitimate issue, like when she had an infection and an albumin of 1.8, she truly wasn't a candidate at that time. But I could see that the wounds were temporary, that albumin could be improved. And so, you know, from my side of it, I'm just, you know, like holding out my hand, like, you know, put your faith in me and, and let's try to walk together towards a place where you're healthier, where we can do a new referral. And that, you know, she she did the hard work of, of that. And I was really, you know, um, just a witness to it. Well, I'm sure it was, you know, uh, a mutual agreement and it sounds like, you know, you 
you know, supported her in a lot of ways that you you may not realize more than you know, probably. Absolutely. So yeah. it's a, a bright call out. I think it's been a great story that you both shared with us today and everybody. I mean, I think this is amazing. And um, I, I don't see any other questions, but does anybody else have any questions or comments? Again, I think this has been really interesting and fascinating. Love to hear your story, success, and it really encourages, it sounds like a lot of people on the call today to go on and, you know, get out there and share it. So, um, you know, again, thank you both for being here today. We really appreciate taking time out of your days to- uh, I would just call. like to, I would just like to say on Colette's part that she would, she's a very talkative person um, and she talks to every, she would talk to everybody on the ship coming in, going out, you know, hi, how you doing? And if she knew other people were struggling, not just with things related to transplant, but also amputations, um, you know, she's uh, does a lot of mentor work with people uh, in that regard as well. But she was a, a voice of encouragement to other patients to keep moving forward um, with their own transplant process. So. I think that that was helpful in a way too, that you could see what is possible. Right. And I have to tell you, Colette, I love your analogy with the cheese. And <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it, sounds, it sounds so simple, but so powerful, you know, and it, whether it's your cheese, you, you, yours has to be cheese. We all have our other, whatever that is, right. you, know, yes. you know, to compare. So what's, you know, when you're looking at, is it my life or my health versus cheese? whatever that is, you know, right. bread, you know, you know, put it in perspective and down to something. When you say it out loud, it sounds kind of like, oh, that is not, <laughs> you know, it's not that important. Right. You know, just saying that, finding that what you're finding your cheese, right? For everybody. It's very right. good. Find your own cheese. Yeah. Find well, your there's own a new cheese. quote. <laughs> and it's, and it's so crazy because especially fluid, you know, they encourage you to drink so much fluid after transplant to keep that kidney flushed and here you know she also you know works so hard on fluid control right. um you know I've, I've had people get into trouble where they would be dehydrated after transplant because now it's hard to like reintegrate fluid when you've right. been working so hard not to do it so um you know it is there's a change of mindset to adjusting to dialysis but then, you know, when you get to transplant, there's some adjustment that goes on there. And I think sometimes people aren't ready for that because you're just thinking, oh, I'm going to get a transplant and all of this is behind me. But you still have challenges that you will face. So um, and it's hard to know what those will be for each person. But just to have in your head that it's not going to be perfect. Exactly. I just wanted another comment. I didn't know if you saw it, but um, from Tara. You have gone through a lot and definitely don't look like what you've been through. You have a remarkable story. Keep telling it. People need to hear about how to get through the ups and downs of the transplant journey. So yes. a lot thank you, Tara. Yeah. 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 yeah, very nice. Thank you. Very nice accolades in there for you, um, both of you. So and what you've done. And, you know, again, Lisa, uh, kudos to you for increasing your transplant wait list, you know, doubling that in two years. That's a pretty awesome journey of your own. And um, yeah. you know, really great work that you're doing.